All right, so starting uh, next time, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Um, we're not going to be doing the rhetoric stuff quite so much. Instead, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at um, a couple of philosophy readings that I'm printing out for you and uh, distributing. Um, and then what we'll do when we get to class, right, you should already have at least a vague outline of what you think is going on in the essay written when you come to class. You'll talk it through with the rest of your assigned group members, and then you will assign one person from the group to stand up and defend your philosopher's position against all the others, right? To explain what your philosopher's position on the issue is and why you think your philosopher is right. Everybody will get a turn to speak. And then you can all go back to your corners, come up with a rebuttal of the other philosophers, right? And then um, choose someone else to speak, right? So the groups will be made up of four people each. So we'll be doing this five times. This means that everybody will have a chance to sort of perform all roles, right? So make sure that it's not the same person doing the same things every time. Um, you will also be in the same group every time, right? So you will keep working with the same people. So let me just distribute the uh, assignment that goes with this. And then we'll talk through this a little bit. Okay, so your group assignments are at the bottom of the page, right? So if you could uh, indicate who you are when I call your name so your group members can see who they're working with, right? So group one is Ari, Glenn, Pinson, and Stanfield. And I just sort of went through alphabetically here. Yeah, Nick? Are we short one? Yeah. Okay. So group two is Bateman, Jackson, Rogers, and Summer. Group three is Benjamin, Langston, Scott, and Wilson. And group four is Gatto, Marchant, Sheets, and Yant. He's getting his wisdom teeth pulled. He's the guy who usually sits right there. So he won't be with us today. But this is what you will be, what each group is going to be working on for next time. Right? Group one, your assignment is Plato. Group two, your assignment is the Aristotle article. Group three, you will be reading George Barclay. And group four, you will be reading and defending Martin Heidegger. directly responsible for reading and writing about your assigned philosophers essay but having the others to look at will help you to put your philosophers ideas into context by giving you something to compare them to right so in general when you are doing the reflection pieces it will be a good idea to compare what your assigned philosopher has to say with what other philosophers have said on the same subject, right? Um, this also goes for sort of like week to week, right? 
because these are all going to build up to the larger paper assignment, it's a good idea to compare the philosopher you're reading, say, this week to the one you read last week, right? How might these ideas relate to each other? Um, how can I get the? How might I get these to work together at paper, right? Even if they're not talking about the same thing. So, as far as what you're actually going to be doing with these, right? You're going to be writing a 500-word analysis of your philosopher, right? So, because it's only 500 words, right? That's actually pretty short. So don't try to cover every point your philosopher makes, right? Try to do what I asked you to do with that second summary of the Concerning Hobbits piece, right? Choose something specific to focus on when you're writing. Choose some specific aspect of what your philosopher is talking about to focus on. Um, you are also going to have to read your philosopher sympathetically, right? Even if you think that the philosopher that you have been assigned is completely full of shit, you are going to have to defend that position, right? The point of this, right, one of the major things I want you to get from this is that it's important to learn how to understand and get inside a, a position that you yourself might not necessarily agree with, right? So that's why I want you to simply defend your philosopher's position, right? Whether or not you personally agree or disagree, right? So when you're writing the reflections, first, as we got here, like pay very close attention to the language your philosopher uses. Quote directly, right? Pick out short quotes that you think illustrate important points and try to find meaning in the words that they choose to express themselves. Right? Remember, we've talked about how word choice does matter. Second, imagine how each philosopher would respond to the other's arguments. How would each defend his or her particular viewpoint from attack? And third, as I said, these are not opinion pieces. Right? I'm not asking what you think about this. I want you to read the assigned philosopher sympathetically. Now, these are going to be fairly difficult. Does anybody have any questions so far? before I go any further with this. Does this make sense to everybody thus far? Everybody understands what they have to do? All right, if you don't ask questions, I have to assume you understand, right? Okay. So, as you are reading these essays, right, these are gonna be more difficult in all likelihood than the sorts of things you are used to reading. Um, some of the language is gonna be weird, um, some of the sentence structures are going to be, you know, convoluted. So the best advice I can give you is to try to read slowly. Right? Read slowly, read carefully, read it more than once, right? Try to go through it once to get the main idea, and then go through again and examine in closer detail the kinds of examples that the philosopher uses to prove his point, right? The kind of language he expresses himself in. You are also going to want to try to define any key terms the philosopher uses right away. This goes for, well, one, any words that you don't know that the philosopher seems to use a lot, and any everyday words that the philosopher seems to be using in a, to mean something that you're not used to it meaning, right? So, for example, when philosophers talk about things like will and necessity, right, these words have meaning in everyday conversation, but they mean something different when philosophers use them. So try to infer from context what the philosopher means when he uses these kinds of words. And if you can't infer from context, right, it's okay to, right, one, look it up, or two, ask me, right? And this is one thing like that you can that you can always do at any stage of this, right? You can always ask me for help. If you want me to look over it something for you, if you have questions about what you're reading, right, please come to me for help. That's what I'm here for. Alright. Um, also, 
once you've at least gone through the essay and got the main idea, I want you to think about the types of examples chosen or the language in which the philosopher expresses himself. What does it reveal about his particular concerns or thought processes, right? So what can we tell, for example, about a philosopher who writes articles that look like mathematical proofs, right? What does that suggest about the way his mind works or about the way he's thinking? What about one who communicates mostly in metaphor or analogy, right? What might that reveal about the philosophical system that he's working with or describing? Okay, so any questions about this so far? Anything at all? Okay, so this first set of essays that you're going to be looking at are concerned with the branch of philosophy called metaphysics. Does anybody know what metaphysics means? Anybody ever heard this term before? Metaphysics or metaphysical? Okay. So essentially each branch of philosophy asks a particular question and attempts to answer it. The question that a metaphysician asks is, what exists? Right. What is real? And so all four of the, these essays are going to be offering an answer to this particular question. So what I want you thinking about as you're reading, right, first and foremost, right, think about what your philosopher regards as real and to what Does he oppose it, right? Like, what is the opposite of the real for your philosopher? Secondly, is your philosopher an idealist? or a materialist. An idealist is someone who believes that ideas make up a higher reality, right? That ideas are what's real. A materialist is much more concerned like with actual physical substance, right? And things that you can actually sense. So which does your philosopher seem, seem more concerned with, right? Ideas or actual physical substances? And finally, to what commonly held beliefs Does your philosopher react? Right. Each of these thinkers is reacting against some other set of beliefs, right, that they will describe in the article. So I want you to pay close attention to how they describe this other set of beliefs and how they attempt to dismantle it, okay? All right, does anybody have any questions about this? So you will be coming to class with something prepared, right, to work with your group. But one of the reasons I want you guys working in groups for this is that way you can help each other understand what you're reading, right? 
you can sit and talk through together what each of you got out of this. Right, and I will come around to each group and try to help talk you through it as well, okay? Right, so, we're good. We understand what we're doing. And if at some point we do not understand what, we do, what we're doing, we will ask questions. Okay, right, good. Because yes, the most important smart person thing one can do is to understand the limits of one's knowledge and when one needs to ask for help. All right, so today, oh, one more thing I want to note about this, and this is just completely in terms of form and structure. What I do not want is one great big chunk of undifferentiated 500 words, right? I want well-organized paragraphs, right? Every time you shift to a new idea, Start a new paragraph. Right, this is just a way of keeping your, on the one hand, it's a way of signposting to the reader that you're moving on to something else. But it's also a way of keeping your thoughts organized, right? Say, so, okay, I'm talking about this up here. I'm talking about this related but slightly different thing down here. And I'm talking about this other thing here, right? So make sure that you're giving me real paragraphs. Okay. So we're going to work today on thesis statements and how you can use the evolution of a thesis statement as a kind of organizing principle for a paper. Right? So we'll start by working on an example together here. Then we'll talk about um, how to recognize when you've got a thesis statement that isn't quite up to par. And then we'll do, you'll do some work on your own. Um, for the stuff we're going to do on our own, um, you're going to need this sheet that I gave you guys last time with all the stuff about um, urban and suburban zoning and whatnot. Does anybody not have this? I have a few extras. Okay. Right, you two were not here last time. You guys were not here last time. But everybody else will have it, right? If you don't, I still have a few extra. Okay, so what is a thesis statement? It's a claim, yeah. It has to be a claim, right? Is the thesis just any claim, though? It's the controlling claim in your paper, right? The thesis is the main argument around which your paper is organized. So it isn't just a claim. It's a claim that provides a kind of connective tissue throughout all the paragraphs. It kind of gives the paper a spine. Right? Each paragraph needs to relate in some way back to this main argument or else you're getting off topic. So we've done some a little bit of work on generating potential thesis statements over the past couple sessions, right? So, you know, we looked at that dead parrot sketch and thought about that in terms of the shopkeeper customer relationship, right? We thought about that in terms of um, you know, class relationships in England, right? You have the scruffy little working class pet shop worker and the snooty upper class customer. 
You know, we looked last time at that John Prine song and how it uses um, patriotic tropes to undermine ideas of unthinking patriotism. So <clears throat> we pretty much know what we're doing when it comes to trying to generate a big claim, right? We look at a set of evidence and then we try to come up with a claim that accounts for all or most of it, right? So as an example here, um, how many of you are familiar uh, with the movie Titanic? Okay, um, I actually hate that movie with a fiery burning passion um, because, you know, my heart is cold and black and dead, but <clears throat> since it's something that just about everybody has seen, it actually kind of works well as an example for this for various reasons. Okay, so what's Titanic about? <laughs> okay, is the movie actually about the boat, though? Yeah, the the sink the sinking of the ship, right? Yeah, you know, spoiler alert there for those who haven't seen it. Yes, the boat sinks. Um, yeah, the the sinking of the ship is just a backdrop for a love story, right? Okay, so let's start there, right? Sinking of ship, right? Absolutely, just background. And who's involved in our love story? Okay, Jack. And tell me about Jack. What is Jack like? Love artist. Okay, yeah, lower class artist. What else can we say about Jack? How does he get onto the ship? Did he pay for his ticket? No, he wanted the game. Yeah. Right, so. Arguably doesn't really belong on the ship, right? Yeah, he won the ticket. Again, what else, what else can we say about this character? Anything, any other important features we can think of? Kind of the only person does whatever he wants. Okay, independent. All right. And who's on the other side of this love story? Okay, Rose. And tell me about Rose. She's rich. Okay. Rose is rich. What else do we know about Rose? Okay, yeah. Involuntary engagement, right? Yes. Yes, she has been engaged to be married to a real piece of shit, right? What else can we say about Rose? She's bored of her lifestyle. Okay, yeah. What else? Personality-wise, how is she similar to or different from Jack? She's independent. Is she independent? She's more reserved. Why would you say more reserved? Whereas Jack would just do whatever he wants. Uh-huh. Rose is more reliant on the social yeah, at least initially she's a rule follower, right? Okay, so one thing that is fairly easy to pick up here is that we've got two lovers of different uh, class backgrounds, right? How do they meet? Um, she's about to commit suicide. Uh-huh, yep, she's, she's going to take a header off the boat, right? And he talks her down. Right? 
right? And that brings them together, right? So are these two people who would have really had the chance to encounter each other on land? They probably would never have run into each other, right? But on the floating city of a cruise ship, right, all things are possible. So one thing that we could, so we could start, right, our initial working thesis could be something like this, right? In Titanic, the ship creates a special world where class norms are suspended and lovers from different backgrounds can come together. But then let's think about how well this actually accounts for what happens in the movie, right? How easily are these two lovebirds able to move in each other's worlds? Not very easily. Explain. Well, when, like, when he tries to go into her world, then everybody, sh everybody in her little circle like, shuns him. Same thing yes. when she goes into his world, at first it's kind of awkward until she uh -huh. proves that she's not snooty. Yeah, but she still doesn't really quite fit in down there, right? So they go up above decks, right? For the, you know, nice little black tie dinner. And yeah, the, the people in the upper decks are real assholes to him, right? They treat him like dirt. Say, oh, thank you, yes, thank you for stopping her from jumping off. You can, you can go now, boy, here's your reward. Um, <clears throat> and when she goes below decks with him, right, People are nice to her, but it's also clear that this is not really her world, at least not yet, right? So any kind of suspension of class norms seems to be kind of illusory, right? It kind of looks like that's what happened, what, what's happening, but not really. So how would we revise this thesis statement in light of that complicating evidence. Specify Jack and Rose. Okay, yeah. That despite the rigid class separation still exists on the ship, Jack and Rose managed to create a class-free bubble. Would that be a fair interpretation, do you guys think? Because they're only, it seems like they're only like comfortable when they're by themselves, when they're isolated from everybody yeah, else. Yeah, they have to get away from other people in order to, to be together, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> let's think about how good, though, this particular thesis. It seems better than the initial thesis, right? It seems to account for more evidence than the initial thesis. But how does their love affair end up playing out? He died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I seem to remember something about a girl on a very, very large door. 
Yeah. And a boy freezing to death in the water, right? It was a door for one. <laughs> but you know, here, here's you know the thing to consider in that as well, right? It's important here which one of them lives and which one of them dies. Yeah, and what's the? I mean, apart from gender, what's the big difference between them? Yeah, the rich girl lives, and the poor boy dies. We can compare this as well with the scenes where people are rushing to the lifeboats, right? The people down in steerage, you know, down in the cheap rooms, are locked downstairs because there aren't enough life lifeboats because the stupid ship was supposed to be unsinkable, right? There aren't enough lifeboats for the rich folks either, but that gives some of them a chance to heroically sacrifice themselves, right? You know, to go and sit in the smoking lounge and listen to the band continue playing while the women and children get onto the lifeboats. Meanwhile, the poor passengers are seen struggling to get past the, you know, the, the crew who are keeping them down below, right? So <clears throat> there seems to be a higher value here placed on the lives of upper class characters and the lives of lower class characters, right? So our initial idea turns out to be little more than a nice fantasy, right? So we can revise this thesis in a more final version as something like this, right? Like, so while Titanic appears to want to suspend class hierarchies, in the end, the film only reinforces them by valuing the lives of rich characters over those of poor characters. And we wouldn't necessarily have to stop there either, right? We could continue to apply more pieces of complicating evidence to come up with a thesis that is more specific, right? But let's look at the structure of our two more specific thesis statements as well, right? How do you notice these, how are these sentences set up grammatically? The books are off, like, say, kind of like questions on like worms of the spider, like wild, like wild appear, worms of the spider. Okay, yeah, they both, they're both they both two-clause statements, right? And the subordinate clause comes first and expresses the conventional wisdom or the idea we're actually reacting against, right? A good thesis statement is usually going to have to apply some kind of back pressure to another idea, right? So in this case, right, we're applying back pressure to our own initial idea, right? That Titanic appears to want to suspend class hierarchies, right? But after looking more closely, this is what we think is really going on, right? So you can do this with your own ideas from earlier in the paper. You can do this with, you know, other people's ideas, right? It is often a good idea when coming up with a thesis statement to find some other idea to react against. Now, if you wanted to actually write a paper on this topic, you could do it by a very similar sort of process, right? You would start by laying out your basic evidence 
and deciding on an interpretive context. Right, now an interpretive context is really just the lens through which you are looking at a particular topic. Right, and that's something you set up in your introduction, right? Your introduction is meant to tell your reader what the basic background focus of your argument is going to be, right? This is the lens I'm looking at it through. So in this case, what's the interpretive context that we've chosen? What have we chosen to, like, what have we chosen to be the main thing we want to talk about about this movie? Well, that's our basic argument, right? But what's the context we're setting up for that argument? Are you, is that just finger twiddling, or do you have a? I kind of want to see. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we are looking at the love story rather than the historical backdrop, right? So that's part of our interpretive context. But what is the thing that we're focused on in all three iterations of our thesis statement? Class structure. Class structure, right? Exactly, right? So that's the thing we've picked as an interpretive context. So when we write an introduction for this paper, that's the thing we're going to try to zero in on. So if we're going to write an introduction to a paper like this, it might look something like this, and just bear with me. Okay. So we start with the historical event, right, and how it relates to the film. James Cameron's 1997 film, Titanic, takes its name and basic premise from the 1912 disaster that claimed the lives of 1,500 people. ship is merely a backdrop to the cross-class romance between Jack artist and a drifter, and Rose, an upper class girl, whose family has fallen on hard times, thus necessitating marriage to her boyfriend. The destruction of the ship and the question of who gets to survive thus becomes socioeconomic hierarchies the film seems
keen to criticize. So what I've done here is provided a buildup for a fairly broad basic iteration of my thesis, right? This is the, I know that the, the movie is based on this particular historical event, right? And I think it's weird that you would make this the backdrop for a love story, but okay. But this is the thing that I actually want to talk about, right? I want to talk about the way the movie uses the sinking ship as a framing device for a love story that seems to be critical of class structures, right? So I've set up here and you know the basic lens through which I want to look at the movie. Everybody understand this, everybody got this. Now we would do something similar if, say, we were writing a paper comparing Amish paradise to gangsta's paradise, right? What we would need to do is establish the similarity between those two videos that would enable us to make the argument, right? It's like, so we would talk about how, while gangsta culture and Amish culture look quite different, they are in fact both insular subcultures that outsiders don't understand well, right? If we were gonna do a paper on that dead parrot sketch, right? We would probably choose either the shopkeeper customer relationship or the class relationship as an interpretive context and center our introduction on that, right? And then what you would do throughout the body of the paper, right, is keep taking this thesis statement and applying evidence to it. And each time you apply a piece of evidence to it, as we did over here, it's probably going to change and narrow the thesis statement a little bit, right? It's probably going to make it a little bit different as you have to keep reconsidering the idea, right? You probably won't have to throw out the original basic idea. But by the time you get to the conclusion, it's going to be a little different. And that's where the conclusion is kind of where you frame your final version of the thesis, right? Okay, so this is what I thought in the introduction. This is what I think now, right? So after going through all of this work, we might come up with something that looks kind of like this. The sinking of the ship is not the liberation from hierarchy that the film seems to promise. Jack's death and Rose's survival combined with the exclusion of the passengers in the lower decks from the rescue boats show that the class structure remains unchanged. Indeed, the disaster allows several wealthy passengers opportunities for heroism and self-sacrifice.
if anything, the status quo is reinforced. promise of Jack and Rose's transgressive romance remains unfulfilled. So this is what we end up with when we've done all of our thinking work, right? And all of our application of evidence to the thesis, right? We end up with a much more refined and specific version of our original idea, right? That doesn't say quite the same thing as the original idea, right? We're still talking about the same basic thing, but now that we've examined the evidence more closely, we have a much more refined idea of what's going on, right? And this is what the conclusion is kind of made to do. Now, I want to go over a couple of weak thesis forms with you, and then sort of let you try some of this work on your own, OK? When you find yourself writing a thesis statement that looks like one of these examples, Right, this should be a warning sign to you that you need to rethink what you're doing. All right, so I will write a statement on the board and you will tell me what is wrong with it. All right, I intend to examine cultural appropriation in the video for Amish Paradise. Why is it weak? You don't have to say like what you're doing, just make your point on what you're analyzing. Yeah, what am I not doing here? I'm not making a claim at all, right? I'm just saying, here's this thing I noticed and I want to talk about it, right? Yeah, I'm not saying, as you said, like anything specific about what I intend to do about this, right? So remember that the thesis is supposed to provide a spine or a roadmap for the whole paper. And this is something that's just going to be way too broad. So what I would need to do to fix this is say something specific about how I think cultural appropriation works in the video, right? So I could say something like, um, you know, well, Amish paradise may seem like an affectionate parody of Amish life. The video structure actually mocks the perceived insularity of the Amish. This still isn't perfect, but you see what I'm doing. I'm actually making a claim here, right, where this first one makes no claim at all. All right, number two. suffrage movement succeeded in getting women the right to vote. 
What's wrong with this? It's just a statement. Yeah, it's just a statement of historical fact, right? There's nothing at stake here. There's nothing to argue about. So what I would have to do is find some way to interrogate this statement of fact, right? Find some sort of idea to push back on. So I might look at what's left out of this historical fact, for example. So I could say something like, while the women's suffrage movement got white women the right to vote, it did so by raising the fear did so by sacrificing the place of black women within the movement. Right, so now I'm making a claim that is actually arguable, right? It's not just a statement of historical fact anymore. I'm taking that historical fact and pushing back on it. All right. All right, third example. The Atlanta Braves are the best team in baseball. Yeah, it's just a personal opinion, right? How do you fix a thesis statement that's just your personal opinion? Right. Well, on balance, the Braves may frequently suck, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> But no, I mean, yeah, like, you, you, like essentially what, we, what you would need to do here is find, is establish some kind of criteria for judging, right? What would make the Braves the best team in baseball, right? So, you know, say, you know, while the Yankees have a better pay payroll and the Red Sox win more games, um, the Braves have a better record of nurturing talent or some such thing like that, right? You would have to find something specific and concrete that defines what you mean by best team in baseball, right? And you would have to do this with anything that is merely an expression of a personal preference or conviction. Um, okay, um, last one, and then I'll let you work on something else. All right. Edgar Allan Poe's short story Fall of the House of Usher is concerned with madness incest and heritage now how many of you have seen thesis statements like this before how many of you have written thesis statements like this before? Okay, what's the problem with it? Yeah, there isn't a claim here. What do we have instead of a claim? It's statement. your opinion says statement. It's kind of a broad statement. It's a broad statement, right? And what does it end with? Poe's short story, The Fall of the House of Usher, is concerned with madness, incest, and heritage. It's the 
Yeah, it's the five paragraph form list, right? This is what I'm going to talk about in body paragraph one. This is what I'm going to talk about in body paragraph two. And this is what I'm going to talk about in body paragraph three, right? And I'm going to write a conclusion that's going to repeat what I said in my introduction. Right, so this is the kind of thinking that the five paragraph form encourages, right? It encourages you not to really go out on a limb with an idea, right? It encourages you to pick something that's fairly simple to prove that you can easily put into three body paragraphs, right? So what you need to do if you actually want to make this a good thesis if you actually want to write a decent paper out of this that actually connects these ideas, which is what the five paragraph form doesn't do, right? It just sort of discusses these things in isolation. What you need to do is think about what these things have in common. Right? There's probably a reason you picked these three ideas. There's some link there. And you just need to figure out what it is. And then that's what your real thesis is, right? That's what you're really arguing about. OK, so any questions about any of this? All right, so what I would like you to try to do is go back to that sheet from last Thursday, right? And look at the claims that you came up with. Right? Look in particular at what you think is your best claim. And what I want you to try to do with that is see how you could revise that claim to account for more of the evidence. right? See if you can get a claim that accounts for just about all of the evidence without falling into one of these weak thesis traps, right? All right, so take about the next 15 minutes to work on that. And I will be right back. Yeah, but I'm missing. 
and sort of think of you know, which one is the best and accounts for the most evidence, right?
Take two more minutes. So tell me what you started with, what you ended up with, and how you got there, right? How you, how you made the change. cars in America since the 1950s has provided for changes in infrastructure by constructing homes, neighborhoods, and towns to accommodate drivers. Okay. Um, I ended up adding since the 1950s since that was a point that came up in a lot of evidence. Okay. 1950s. Okay. Shifted. So, okay. So you made it more specific by adding a particular date range. All right. Good. That helps to contextualize what you're talking about. Um, anybody else? pieces of evidence did you use to get the, to get there? Because um, after the 1950s, sidewalks were rare. Okay. Um, because newer cities and suburbs are not as accessible. They don't have the grid pattern. It's going one way in, one way out. Okay. And um, the, between the 1960s and the 90s, the commercial development became decentralized. So there, are, there isn't as much communication between people because it's more spread out. All right. Good. Okay. Um, so, you know, just... Keep this in mind when you're doing more formal paper assign assignments, right? This is the basic process you should be using to generate and evaluate ideas. Um, contact me if you have any questions while you're working on the philosophy paper, right? We'll see you on Thursday.